What is up, Watch Fam? Happy Friday, and welcome to this week's episode of Liquor On. I am Christian from Theo and Harris, and it's my old man, Rolly. And today, we're going to be jumping into a really amazing conversation um, about the relationship in watches, particularly as consumers and observers, um, between the beauty of a design and the complexity of the movement, and, and really where that, you know, uh, what are those things called? Those the yin yang? No, the teeter totter? You know, the scale. Yeah, scale yeah. How balanced does it really need to be for us to give the okay on the purchase? Let's do it. All right, before we jump in, a quick wristwatch check. What are you wearing, Daddy-O? The GMT. Love it. I actually um, was with someone just the other day, a client of mine, Diego, uh-huh. um, who saw you know yours on your wrist, um, and he fell so in love with it, and he loved your bezel, uh-huh. um, and he actually went out himself and purchased uh, one from 2005, I believe, or 2007. Oh, very nice. Yep. Uh, beautiful. Beautiful. Saludos, Diego. Yep. Uh, and I'm wearing uh, a Cartier, uh, Tank Louis. Uh, it's a Vermeil, so it's not solid gold. It is gold-plated. Mm-hmm. I have it on a blue... Um, uh, alligator strap, killer strap, All right? And an original buckle. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm in love with this watch. Beautiful. Um, both of these watches, specifically my watch, but to some degree or another, both of these watches um, are, are very relevant in today's conversation about design and movement. Right? Where where does the where do the scales need to end for it to be worth it? Do you need to be both supremely designed and supremely manufactured? Can you just be one? You know, it's a funny conversation. And there's a lot of money at stake. It's like buying art. Yeah. You know, so some pieces of art that you say, while they could be masterpieces, yeah. you say, wow, I mean, it's not my thing. Really, it's not my thing. And yet, something that may seem mundane yeah. in the art world could be, be worth millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. You know, wh- Good. Where, does it, it's, yeah. Where, does it, where does that sit? You yeah. Know? And we as consumers, how do we look at it? How yeah. do we value these watches? Right. Uh, so, without further ado, a bottle of wine. What are we drinking today, Daddy? Uh, we're going back to an old friend. We haven't had uh, uh, Goebelsberg. Goebelsberg Gruner Veltliner. Yeah. Okay, from Austria. It's one of my favorite bottles of wine. This is a killer wine. Love it. And would you, wouldn't you know it? The uh, it's Michael Skernick. Yeah, Michael the Skernick importer. I'm I can't you. tell you how many people, <laughs> liquor run viewers, what's up, liquor run fam, um, say they've learned a lot about wine, about watches, um, but the one major tactical takeaway from liquor run yeah. has been this look at the importer. I can't tell you how many people have said, I never looked at it before. Yeah. I never knew. Leonardo Locasio. Locasio. Uh, uh, Michael Skernick. Ordonez. Uh, Ordonez. 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 Yeah. Never even thought about it. Yeah. No, no, they yes, do. several others as well. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on this wine? You've had it before? Yeah, I've had it. First, I'm in love with Gruner Velliner. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the more I drink, the more I love. Uh, yeah. Every time. This, this wine is so crisp. Oh, my God. It's sharp. Fabulous. Yeah, but it doesn't have that over-tart green apple thing. It doesn't. It's no, really well no. There's nice sweetness to it, yeah. but there's that minerality that I, I just, I, I love. Yeah. Um, the more you yeah. drink it, I said this the first time on a liquor on a long time ago, um, it, it begins, and it's subtle, it's subtle, but it begins to taste like, almost like, a, like stones in your mouth. You know, uh, again, subtle, but you have that yeah. taste of hard, kind of cold, wet stones. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. tasty. It's tasty. Uh, I just really recommend people to go out. I mean, yep. go out, try Austrian wines. Yep. Try their red wines, too. Yep. Blaufrankisch. 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 Uh, Gruner Velliner. It's such an uh, unheralded or unsung hero yeah. in the wine world. Deserves a lot Great more point. attention, but let's uh, let's get chatting. So I challenged you and myself, and we'll do one, 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 <laughs> one, um, to to think of two watches mm-hmm. each, right? First, a watch that is in construction or in movement, fairly mundane. Not to say it's bad, but, but you know, in the world of watches, it's average. Not necessarily revolutionary. Not necessarily um, really anything to double take at. Mind you, keeping keeping in mind the great achievements in the world of watches. Okay. Right? But that watch, you still love because of its design in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Right? A watch that's held up by the shorts of design, Mm -hmm. and then a watch that the design is, again, uh, inversely, it's it's mundane, or it's it's not good, Mm -hmm. um, and the movement 
is tremendous. Yeah. Right? So two watches each. What was your first watch? What was the watch that to you, um, although maybe mechanically isn't a wonder, is just a, a beautiful, wonderful, uh, ideal thing to own? Well, I mean, what comes to mind, uh, if we're having this topic, could be the stainless steel uh, Rolex. Nope. Um, like a vintage, yeah, date or date 30, 34 millimeter. 34, yeah. Uh, 34 millimeter. Yeah. Um, uh, classic. Yeah. It oozes with classiness. I mean, a subtle classiness. A little sporty. A little, a little sporty. Dressy. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. But but understated. I think yeah. in 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 in, the, in every in the best way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yet, the movement is nothing, right? To um, nothing to look six times, at. and you know, it's a, it's right. a beautiful mechanical movement. Yeah, right. You know, that's it. Just, yeah. You know, there's nothing about it. There isn't uh, tremendous movement innovation. There isn't tremendous perlage or finishing or right. bridges or, or really anything. Um, it's a time only watch. Some of them have yeah. dates. Some of them don't. Right. You know, you don't really get more simple. And yet, it's that. such a classic. Such oh my a classic God. watch. It's enviable. Yeah, it's enviable. My watch. Okay. The one that I went with um, was from Cartier. Right? It's actually the watch I'm wearing right now. Um, any Cartier, basically, but but specifically the Tank Louis. Right? I think that this watch is one of the best design watches ever. Right? I think that the case dimensions, I think that the crown, I think that the dial configuration, mm-hmm. it's incredible. Right? And brands from all the way up to Patek Philippe have imitated Cartier in their design. Right? The the Tank Louis, I believe, was invented or introduced in 1917, I think, um, and since it has been a watch that has influenced culture. Global culture, right? From the wrist of Truman Capote to Muhammad Ali, I've said this a thousand times. Yes. People who have nothing in common yes. have the Cartier tank in common mm-hmm. because it's pure, pure class. It's a cornerstone of class, right? But really, movements are nothing to, they're not really not that great, you know? Sometimes Cartier put in movements from, uh, I believe, AP. Uh-huh. Sometimes they put in movements from other brands, maybe JLC sometimes. But as a whole, Movement has nothing to do why, with why the tank is popular. I'll go so far as to bring up Andy Warhol, one of the tank's most famous wearers, mm-hmm. said, I don't set the time on my tank. <laughs> I wear the it, tank because it's the watch to wear. It's the, I don't yes. even wind it. Right. What does that tell you? Right. Did movement matter? No. It was about Cartier. And it was about the Louis. Yeah, the, the, the this, Louis, this, yes. This, this yes. rectangle. Yes. This beautiful, it, refined, beautiful, classy rectangle. Beautiful. Right? Yes. So... Both examples of watches that movement, they're, they're fine. They're, yes. they're, they're just good mechanical movements. They're good, serviceable. Yours is way more robust than mine. Mm-hmm. Um, they're reliable movements. But, you know, yeah. beyond that, there's nothing to, nothing to marvel at. And yet they have a nice place in watch history, right? An incredible place. Yeah. All yeah. on design. Yeah. You know? You know what's, uh, what I love? Tell me. This wine. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love Goldsburg. <laughs> this is incredible. Yep. Austria. Yeah, people Com- don't really drink Austrian Comtal wines. Comtal region. Much, right? No, they don't really drink Austrian mm-hmm. wines too much. I know a couple of years ago, they had uh, done. You know, the the Austrian wine council mm-hmm. was trying to really push Austrian wines here in America. Yep. They were doing a nice job. I think uh, if I can help them, I'm going to. It's it's. Yeah. So darn good. Yeah, I, I say uh, this is one of my one of the few bottles of wine that I from time to time crave. I don't find myself craving certain bottles. It's this. This is a wine that I find myself a couple times a year yeah, saying, I gotta go to the store and buy that exact yeah. bottle. Yeah, it's solid. And I wanna sit down, I wanna yeah. drink it. You know? Cheers. Salute. Yeah. Now let's go the other way. The other way. Something that doesn't look so good or odd. Or even ugly. Or even ugly. <laughs> but yet has just a killer movement. Uh, 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 something that is truly um, innovative. Something that is not only well finished. People, people don't talk about movement quality when they talk about finishing alone. Finishing, although, is very important, is not the end all and be all, right? Movement architecture is something that in the in the watch world, particularly in the independent community, is much more um, um, admired, right? Not that anyone can finish a watch well, but that's not true. Um, but finishing is almost taken for granted, whereas movement architecture is not, because so few people do it. You look at Patek Philippe's Nautilus, right? The movement inside is is, is fairly, you know, average. Hate you know, hate to say it. I mean, but it's certainly nothing. And I had this conversation with with a with a big big collector who owns a, a, a 3700 reference, and he said the JLC movement inside my 3700 is not what makes the Nautilus great. And it's the same thing goes with 5711 or, or anything. You know, they're fairly average. You know, fairly average movements. Well decorated, but fairly average mm-hmm. movements. But it's the it's the design. It's the importance of history. Right. Right. So now you chose a watch from really your favorite, what did you play by your favorite brand? Yeah. Uh, 
A Long and Son. Uh, I, I, I love that's probably well not probably, it is my most favorite watch brand. Yep, famous for their movement construction. I love that. I love the 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 platinum or the white gold eighteen fifteen. That's one of your no. I think the white gold. White gold. The white white gold eighteen fifteen is 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 my my Grail watch yeah. with blue strap. Yeah. Oh, God. it's it's a watch that will eventually have to make a, a video <laughs> roll the unboxing. It's a watch that he says he'll never buy, right. but that's you know, right. ultimately, <laughs> hopefully, when the dust yes. settles. That's right. So. I admire A. Lang and Son's simplicity. Yep. That's why I fell in love with the one that I had. Yep. Uh, the quality of the movements, uh, the weight of the watch, yep. the weight on the wrist. Remember the balance cocks of the grave? Oh, beautiful. Yeah, right? that's right. Exactly. Where you can even show them back in Glass Huta yeah, and they'll tell you who, who, who decorated the movement. Right. At, yeah. at every every level. Yeah. Just, just complete... A, a, Total dedication, it, artisanship, oh, right? Yeah. However, yeah, what I don't like, or, or at least the line that I don't like uh, of of uh, of a long and so on is the tourbillon. There, yeah, <laughs> I find them quite ugly. <laughs> it's a, a, a manufacturer that makes such beautiful watches in yeah. such a simplistic manner, yeah. so well thought out, mm -hmm. then puts out this. What I would call like this, yeah, uh, the, the the you know the everything pie and pizza, you know. <laughs> it's got mushrooms, it's got mushrooms pepperoni, pepperoni, peppers, onions, yeah, yeah. sausage. <laughs> Just because they can, <laughs> because they can, and I don't think they have to. <laughs> right, I I agree with you. Um, so so long has has a pretty long history with the Tobillon. Um, at their at their reintroduction to the market in 1994, Longa only released like four or five watches, maybe maybe one more. Than that, um, and one of them was their 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 tourbillon pour la merite, uh, or pardon my French uh, if that's not pronounced correctly. And it, it was a tourbillon with a fusée chain, right? Which was a piece of technology in watchmaking. Only I've ever only held one once. It was actually owned. A dear friend of mine owns it. Um, uh, technique used in, in pocket watchmaking, right? Okay. That really has no place in wrist watchmaking, right? Um, one because the, well, practical well, practicality foremost. It's totally impractical to have this fusée chain within the watch. Okay. Second, it really brings nothing to the watch itself, right? So it's just this complicated thing. Uh, it's a long story and we're gonna get into, uh, we actually have a hands-on video with that watch coming into the story of the Fusé chain and everything like that. But my point is, Longa has a long history with the Tobillon, right? And some are pretty cool looking. My friends is really nice. But I agree with you. I think that in so many instances, their design is so bad yeah. that it's almost painful. Yeah. And it's the opposite of what we love in Longa. It's complete opposite. I just don't think it's necessary. But anyway, so that's one. That's one example yep. uh, where uh, you've got an incredible movement. I just think yep. the, the busyness, the whole the busyness, is just not not necessary. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What about you? I'm gonna go with a watch from a brand that I actually quite admire, um, an FP Journe Monopusher Retropante. It was a watch that was released in 2018. Um, the model line, which was released in three different models, I believe titanium, rose gold, and something else, platinum maybe. I don't remember. Um, it was released after Only Watch, which is a big charitable uh, watch auction. Mm -hmm. um, F.P. Jordan himself designed this this one-off that sold for over a million dollars, whatever. Um, after this, he released a line of watches, you know, that, that, that kind of carry on the legacy of this Monopusher Retroponte. I hate this watch. Now, I mean, just look at it. I think that everything from the from the rubber covering on the bracelet, right? Um, uh, the, the dials are kind of attractive, I think. Um, but it's forty four millimeters. I think that the the way the black plays with the rose gold is is terrible looking. I think that in 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 black, maybe it's titanium. Um, I, I, it looks like a fashion watch. I don't know. I I hate the way this watch looks. It looks like F P Jorn's attempt to be you blow. Actually, pretty good. P pretty good analogy. Yeah, I mean, I, I see how it's. Fu I mean, fundamentally, the different brands. But uh, yeah. you're right. It's a sporty, mm -hmm. quite blingy, big, oversized thing. Yeah. On those levels, I agree. Yeah. Um, but but, f you know, a brand that is made famous by their by their Chronometer Blue or their Souverain. I'm sorry. Again, I don't pronounce the words right. Um, 
not just simple watches, but watches that utilize negative space really well. Watches that are able to have very little going on, and yet it just seems so much. It seems so full-bodied. And then this, it's just ugly, you yeah, know? And yeah. then all the way down to the guilloche dial, um, which I actually like the dial in and of itself, but the dial isn't allowed to shine because of the competition with the rubber on the bracelet and, and on the rubber on the pushers. Watch it fucking ugly. Yeah, it's a complete departure from what, what it distinguishes, is. right? FP Journe. Yep. Yeah. That said, mm -hmm. the Mono Pusher Retro Ponte Chronograph within is remarkable, although a little bit different than mm -hmm. the one from Only Watch in its movement, apparently. I don't know the, I don't know the differences. They were never really released. Um, but apparently they, they made a new movement. F.P. Schwann put probably millions of dollars into research and development on this movement, mm -hmm. right? It took the major brands of the world decades to introduce a new chronograph movement. Patek Philippe themselves were using, you know, base calibers from La Mania for their, cal for, for their, for their chronographs, right? F.P. Jorn, a fairly new player on the block, not as a person, but as a brand, you know, introduces this feat of horology really early. Mm -hmm. You know, it's incredible. And not only did he introduce Amano Pusher Retroponte, which you can get from, you know, kind of, I guess, I'm sure that they, they, they exist out there uh, where you can kind of reinvent what someone else has already done. But there are edits. I mean, there are, there are really proprietarily F.P. Jorn uh, differences to this. And beyond the technical supremacy of the movement as a movement, beyond the finishing and beyond the architecture that made the, the movement itself look so, again, kind of going back to classic F.P. Jorn, this negative space, this not too much, very simple kind of uh, design. They they don't even make the stock movements and put them in all their models. Their three different models of three different metals feature different metal movements within. It just shows how dedicated F.P. Jorn is to producing something that is interesting and different and going above and beyond for their clients, at least, uh, you know, on a, on, a, on a retail end. Um, they're not cheaping out by any means. Mm -hmm. Right? This is a serious thing. And even price-wise, I think around $60,000 for the Titanium model, very fair. You're putting that watch against a Patek Philippe 5070, mm -hmm. uh, or I'm sorry, 5170, which I think by any measure is an inferior watch as, as, as far as movement. So it just shows, wow, it's a value prop too, all things considered. But f it's ugly. Mm -hmm. I mean, this thing is hideous. The four examples here go to show that it's a spectrum, right? Watches can be beautiful, and technically mundane. Yeah. And yeah. that that can be an yes. incredible piece. Yes. An incredible piece. Yep. Watches can be feet of horology. Incredibly complex. I mean, no no holds barred. Just be ugly and undesirable, at least to us. Right? Yeah, I agree. And like art. I yep, like art. It's it's in the eye of the beholder. And and that's what it comes down to. I think the whole point of this episode to to, to wrap it up um, comes down to this. You know, people feel because they because yeah, they read online about other people's opinions. People feel like they have to you know worship certain watches or manufacturers um, because other people worship them, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to marvel at the Monopusher chronograph by F.P. Jorn if it's not your thing. If you think it's kind of ugly and that turns you off, that's cool. Watches are a hobby. Yeah. Like you know, curate your taste. That's it. And that's kind of what we it's what we're all about here at TNH. Mm -hmm. You know, just understanding that, hey, it's watches. Let's not take it so seriously. Yeah. It's fun. Let's it's talk fun. about it and have a drink. And that's what the banter's all about. Salud, Daddy. Salud. Thank you guys so much Cheers, for watching. Guys. See you soon.